And with that said, I want to preach a sermon today entitled Treasure Seekers. Treasure Seekers. Uh, there's a radical freedom in the life that Jesus calls us all to, and we're all called to this place to live life with a singular perspective. It's supposed to be lived with Jesus as the, our priority. It boils down to this key concept uh, that either we, we think that this earth is our home, this is all there is, or this is not our home. This is a temporary setting for the eternal dwellings. And so what you believe about this and how real that is to you will, will dramatically affect the way you live your life. If this world is your only reality, if you do not believe that there's life after this one, then, then uh, you might as well take the philosophy that Paul brings up and he says, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. You might as well just go hedonistic and grab as much joy as you can out of today. I, I quote that scripture often, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die at. But um, that's not... <laughs> I just added a T, which you're not supposed to do. But, but there's an issue. There's a, there's a let's, let's grab as much joy as we can out of today. If there's nothing else, then that's the focus. But if you believe that there is a grand eternity beyond this life, then suddenly that becomes an important issue. When people ask me, have you taken care of your future? I go, which one are you talking about? When I'm 70 or when I'm 3,450? Like, which, which future are we talking about? Yeah, I, I can take out some policies. I can, I can work on, on securing a more comfortable future for my life down here. But better, rather, much more important, is to secure an eternal future. So suddenly when you begin to understand that our life, when I come into Christ, is called and yearned and tuned to the kingdom, to the king and his kingdom, that that becomes the defining feature and the presiding factor of my life. I start to live for the king and his kingdom. And so you'll find in the New Testament that this is what the Scripture uh, deals with. It talks about people who are worldly because they have a passion and a love and a connection only with this world. People who are godly have a connection and a passion with the king and his kingdom. And so where you are on that fulcrum, where you are on that spectrum, it, it says something about what you believe. But if you believe that there is life after this one, you begin to say, you know what, I'm going to start investing and I'm going to start working in this life for that one. And that seems to be pretty much the standard theology, the teaching that Jesus himself gave and everybody who knew him did. But Jesus calls us for this then fundamental prioritization of our lives. Um, it's not a slight polishing or an incremental change that happens when we come into Christ. When we come into Christ, there's a dramatic explosion of new and an absolute removal of old. Uh, everything has become new and different and transformed because you have moved from death to life. You have been an object of wrath. Now you're a beloved child. You, everything, everything about your existence has changed. And we cannot in, embrace that revolution, come into Christ and remain in the same mindset as we used to be. There's this call to everybody who's in Christ. You need to transform. You need to change the way you think. You need to reprioritize your lifestyle. You can't live like you used to because everything is new. Think new. Think different. And so this prioritization of the king and the kingdom is to arrange the kingdom and the value of the kingdom in its relative order of importance, which Jesus said was first. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and everything else will be added to you, is what Jesus said. So to give the kingdom priority is not the natural drift of the human condition. You notice that. It's not the natural drift of every human being. People don't get born and as they, as they grow into maturity go, oh, I think I'm going to be more spiritual. I'm going to focus more on Jesus. No, the natural drift is away from the kingdom. And so if you want to be somebody who prioritizes your life for the kingdom, it's something that you have to seek after. You have to pursue. You have to decide. You have to be somewhat deliberate about reorienting, making a choice. The king and his kingdom will be first in my life. And so I want to talk to that this morning about how we can prioritize uh, and be treasure seekers. There are three imperatives in the chapter of Matthew 6. I want to take you there quickly, just as a backdrop to what we're going to preach. But the three imperatives are simply this. Number one, these are imperatives in the Greek means a command. These are three things that Jesus said emphatically. Listen, do not store up for yourself treasure here. Store up for yourself treasure in heaven. I want you to feel the weight of that. That's not a suggestion from Jesus. That's a command. You are supposed to store up treasure in heaven. 
You go, that, uh, that sounds weird. I'm supposed to go after treasure? Yes. Not treasure here. Treasure there. Jesus em- emphasized, store up for yourself treasure in heaven. Number two, he said, don't worry about your life right here. Don't worry about your life in verse 25. Don't worry about what you eat or drink or wear in verse 31. Don't worry about tomorrow, verse 34. And the third thing Jesus said is, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. Three imperatives. This is what I want you to be doing. And so (coughs) this reckless freedom that God gives us is amazing to me because the Lord comes into our life and gives us freedom. And it's astounding that he allows me to make these kinds of really serious and impacting decisions for my own life. It, it seems like it, it would be better if he, com- if he controlled us, if he made us make the right decisions. But he doesn't. He gives us a reckless, a glorious freedom. But he doesn't leave us as orphans. He comes to us, and the Holy Spirit constantly works in us and woos us towards the things that God, he constantly, the Holy Spirit is extremely faithful to woo us towards the call of God, to stir in you and in me the desires that are in line with his will, as we spoke last week. He's wanting to move us in a way. And so this constant whisper from the Holy Spirit is to reorient us, to reprioritize, to constantly put Jesus first, to constantly tune our lives to his word, to constantly be doing whatever he says, and there's something there that I think the Lord wants to stir up again this morning. He calls us, and he moves us, and he stirs us in line with his plan. Now, when we respond to that inner stirring of the Holy Spirit, when we keep in step with the Holy Spirit, we discover that there's a great kingdom momentum that starts to build in our life. Our life starts to be oriented towards the kingdom, and that means sometimes that our life is is in a clash with what is going on in the world. Because the kingdom's values and the, and the world's values are, are very much and very often the opposite of one another. And so there's the stirring of the spirit, the internal desire to, I'm going to learn to live in a kingdom way. I'm going to learn to prioritize the king and his kingdom. When we do that, our lives are reoriented towards an unseen reality, a greater glory. And this becomes the dominant principle of our lives. Our behavior is dominated by this understanding. It's the prime motivator of our lives, and it's the defining method of our decision-making. So while we live in this world, and we participate here, and we engage, you're not supposed to be hermits. We're not supposed to withdraw from the world. You're supposed to be, live big and bold and enjoy everything. But this world is not all that we're supposed to. We're supposed to dominate this world, but this is not all we were born to do. We live from an unseen realm. And that, but there are things that we can do in this life that transfer and translate into the next. So I'm going to talk um, this morning about some of the things that you and I can engage in that will lay up for ourselves treasure, because this is something Jesus commanded us to do. So I want to talk about how do I lay up treasure? How can you lay up treasure on that side? In essence, we do things here that register there. We can send some things on ahead of us, as the scripture says. We can bank treasure there. As one scripture says, lay up treasure for the life to come. So let me talk about three ways that you can, and this is very brief and I'm talking very quickly, I'm aware, because I I don't have a whole bunch of time, but I, I wanna talk about laying up treasure. And the first way you can do this is what I call treasure for treasure. This simply means that there are some things that God is going to put within your realm. There are some uh, resources, finances, uh, that God puts into your hands and into your control. If you are somebody who is wealthy, that is a profound blessing to you because you have more opportunity than others to store up for yourselves treasure in heaven by what you do with the wealth that God has put in your hands today. So let me take you to Matthew 6. I want to read through that just briefly. And let's look at it. Matthew 6, 19, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Literally in the Greek, Jesus said, do not treasure your treasures. Do not treasure your treasures, because if you, if you have a treasure of treasure in your heart, moth and vermin, anything, the, the, the Greek means anything that can gnaw or corrode, 
that treasure, this treasure on earth is subject to corrosion. And where thieves can break in and steal it, in, in that day they called them mud diggers because most of the houses were built with mud bricks, right? So you, you, you drilled a hole through the mud brick and then you could steal people's goods. They called them the mud diggers. And so don't be a mud digger. Don't be a, a treasurer of treasures on earth, Jesus said. Don't do that. Store up for yourselves treasure in heaven. And he said, because wherever you, wherever you see your treasure is, that's where your heart gets drawn to. And so Jesus said, rather than treasure the treasures down here, start to build treasures up there. And when you build treasures in heaven, when you build treasures against the life to come, your heart starts to be drawn ever increasingly to your treasure. And you start to want to add to the treasure. And, and then you don't want to start doing anything now that's going to diminish that. So you go, oh, no, I have an investment. If you've, been stuck, if you've stuck with an investment for 30, 35 years, and somebody goes, oh, I've got a new one, you go, no, I'm just going to let this one ride. And so the longer, you, the longer you have this as a habit, the more you invest in a treasure in heaven, the less you start to value the treasure here, and the more you start to treasure the treasure there. Possessions on this earth are not for the accumulation. That's what Jesus said. Don't, they, that's not the point. They're for distributing in Jesus-honoring ways. Now, I'm not saying you don't look after your future and don't look after your pension. Like, look after yourself. I'm just telling you, Jesus said there's a treasure that you can turn your heart to that is not in this world. And you can use what you have in this world and you can swap it out for an eternal weight. Dollar for dollar. This dollar, subject to inflation. Subject to thieves. Things can gnaw away at this dollar. But if you give this dollar and it's in heaven, thieves can't break in. Never deflates. Some years back, the Lord had spoken to us to start some radio stations. We started the first one and I needed, uh, I needed about $90,000 to start the first studio and get the first staff up and running. And I went to the church and told them the story and uh, after that service, uh, one of the families in the church came up to me and, and <laughs> had a check in their hand for the 90000 Gave me a $90,000 check and said, we feel like the Lord said we should do this. They, they owned a business. The, the, it was a father and his two sons. They owned a business in the, in the city. It had been doing really well. They gave me the 90000 We started the radio station with that. Uh, that wasn't the only money, but that was a considerable lump of what it took to get us started. Um, and over the next three years, the radio station at its peak was, was communicating with about 350,000 people a week. And uh, there were many, many hundreds of people were coming to faith every week through that radio station. And then about three years later, that business, long story, but they, they lost the business, overextended, uh, somebody bought them out, and they walked away with nothing from the business. And I always felt a slight pang of guilt because I was always wondering if that 90,000 was the thing that broke the back. And when I spoke to them, they said, that was the only 90,000 we never lost. Amen. See, and I believe that. See, they took 90,000 and they exchanged it for an eternal weight of glory. It's banked in heaven. And there, it cannot fade. There, it cannot spoil. There is the reward of the generosity. Because I think when we get to heaven and those hundreds and thousands of people who've come to faith through that mechanism, and when Jesus stands and opens the book, he's gonna call that family up. Come here. Well done. You want to lap treasure in heaven? You can do it with treasure on earth. It's one of the mechanisms. Treasure for treasure. Luke 12. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give them to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will never fail. Where no thief comes near and no moth destroys, for where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Isn't that interesting? Jesus said, if you can give to the poor, it's, it's logged in heaven. You remember the story of, of Cornelius? And Cornelius is a Gentile, and he's praying, and the, an angel appears to him and says, Cornelius, your gifts to the poor have come up like a memorial in, in heaven. So God sent me here. Go and call Peter. He's going to come preach to you. That's the guy who started the Gentile church. You know why? Because God said, that man is generous to the poor. It was logged in heaven. 
Now, the treasures and the purses we are commanded to provide ourselves in heaven have some interesting characteristics. They cannot be eroded or depreciated or stolen or diminished. It means they will not wear out. It means if you're a millionaire, you're a millionaire for eternity. I like that. Luke 12 adds that they cannot grow old and they will not fade. Matthew 19. Young man came to Jesus and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What do I need to, to, to be secured on the other side? And Jesus said, keep the commandments. And then he said, I've kept all the commandments. What do I still lack? And Jesus said, if you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions, give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Treasure for treasure. You can swap out the treasure for an eternal one. But it requires faith. If you believe in this, if you believe that what Jesus said was true, then this is a relatively easy thing. It's a, it's a no-brainer. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I'm sure I'll give. I'm, I'm going to log a treasure in heaven. If, you have, if your treasure is there, then this is, this is a relatively easy generosity. It's a semi-stingy semi generosity. No, don't say thank you. I, 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 no, no, I don't want my treasure. I don't want my reward here. I don't, I'm, I'm logging it there. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had a great wealth. This, this blows me away. Jesus, he said, Jesus, what do I want? Jesus said, listen, all the money you have, yeah, give it away and you'll, have, you'll, have, you'll be a millionaire in heaven and then come walk with me, follow me. Jesus only had offered that to 12 other people. What an offer this young man had. What an offer that was. From, think of it from Jesus' perspective. Listen, give away all the money. Give away your treasure because I can see your heart's lost to it. Give it away. And I'll tell you what, you'll have treasure in heaven for eternity. And then in the meantime, for this life, come walk with me. I'll show you an adventure. And he walked away sad because his treasure was in his treasures. Jesus wasn't upset that he was rich. He was just challenging the fact that his heart was given over to his treasure. So giving and generosity are a great way to secure a, a, an eternal treasure. Luke 14, Jesus told us that when you give to those who can't repay you, that repayment will happen at the resurrection. Second one. I, I'm going faster. I think I proved the point. We could, we could, there's more scripture. We could have, we could have gone on. <coughs> Service for treasure. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters in Corinthians 15, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always. 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 When it's convenient, when you feel like it, <laughs> always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Give yourself always fully to God's work because that labor is not in vain. It's not unseen. It did not go unnoticed. You know, there's a whole category of angels. If you study uh, theology, you study things like this. Angelology is a study of angels. And one of the things in angelology that I learned was there's a whole category of angels called the watchers. Their job is to watch and record. The Bible talks about a great cloud of witnesses, the heroes of the faith. Jesus is called the faithful and true witness. There's nothing that we do that goes unnoticed. Hebrews 6, verse 10. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love that you have shown him as you have helped his people. Ooh. The love that you have shown him as you've helped his people. One of the best ways, one of the best ways you can bless me is show dignity and honor and kindness to my wife and my family. It's the same with you. So many people want to love Jesus and then badmouth his bride to him. You know, you, you're wonderful, but that bride of yours, she just, she's just weird. He will not forget your work and the love that you showed him as you helped his people. You serve, you do the ministry God called you to. You serve his people. It's logged. It's not in vain. You want to log some treasure in heaven? Serve God's people. 
God is not forgetful and he's not stingy. He remembers even a cup of water given to one of his servants. Remember that? Jesus said, if, go. And if they accept you, they accept the one who sent you. They're accepting me. And he says, I tell you a truth. Not anybody who gives you a cup of water because I sent you will fail to receive their reward. Anybody who serves his people, he watches. And he watches over even just a little bit. You looked up and somebody who was serving God was a little thirsty. And you go, hey, here's, some, here's a cup of water. Jesus said, that's logged in heaven. Moving on. Trouble for treasure. This is not the one that everybody signs up for, but I, I want, I just, it is there in Scripture. So let me take you to 2 Corinthians 4. <laughs> Therefore, we do not lose heart. Now, outwardly, we're wasting away. Yet inwardly, we're being renewed day by day, for our light and momentary afflictions are achieving for us an eternal glory. That far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what's on unseen. For what's seen is temporary, what's unseen is eternal. Okay. So if I have some light and temporary problems and troubles, they achieve for me, if I stay faithful to the Lord, an eternal weight of glory. That'll change your perspective of your troubles. It's not, oh, woe is me, so, oh, 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 wow. <laughs> Look at me. See, if you see it properly, you start to go, eternal way to glory. Somebody curses you because you love Jesus. Somebody mocks you because you took a stand for God. You go, praise God. Eternal way to glory. If I told you, listen, for one week, I'm going to slap you and spit at you and call you names and humiliate you in public. At the end of the week, you get $100 million. How many of you would sign up for the week? I think I could handle you calling me names for a week. Our light momentary afflictions are achieving for us an eternal weight of glory. We can, we can swap affliction for glory, lightness for weight, momentary for eternal. The light... The light is an eternal weight. That's what Paul said. The momentary brings eternity. We can prioritize what lies ahead and enforce that priority right now. Hard things now secure a different eternity. Nobody wants to go through hard things. No, one, no one's happy about that, except when you begin to see this. Trouble now Hardship now, securing for me a, a, an eternal, better future. Your heart starts to yearn and move there. That's not to say we're not trusting God for breakthrough now, not to say we can't, but, we, but there's something underneath all of that that goes, all righty, this is not all there is for me. This is not all I live for. I'm living for an unseen realm. We fix our eyes, Paul says, because of this reality on the unseen, not on the seen. The seen stuff is temporary, unseen. Romans 8, 18, how about this one? I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. How about 1 Peter 4? I'm just running through these quickly, so catch me if you can. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spur of glory and of God rests on you. Let me wrap it up. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul says, I want you to know something. He says, I came as a master builder and I laid a foundation among you. He says, you should be careful how you build on that foundation because no one can lay any other foundation other than the foundation that I laid because the foundation I laid among you was Jesus Christ and him crucified. It's a solid foundation. There's nothing else that will earn you salvation. There's no other works that you can do. There's no other standard by which you can gain entry into heaven. The only way you get to heaven is through this foundation, your faith in the person of Jesus Christ and what he accomplished on the cross. I laid that foundation carefully among you. Be very careful now how you build on top of that foundation. And he said, some of you 
are going to build wisely with gold, silver, and precious stones. Some of you are going to build with mud, straw, and stubble. And he said, I, I want to just remind you, everybody, that the day is coming when we stand in front of the Lord, and he said, fire is going to test the quality of everybody's work. What you have built on top of the foundation that is laid, the foundation you did not earn, the foundation you could never earn, the foundation that is a free gift of God's grace and faith that he gave you. And once that is laid in your life, he says, now, okay, now, now, now build on that foundation. Be careful. And so we build on that foundation. And Paul just puts this caveat there. He says, listen, I don't, it, it doesn't matter how cute you are. It doesn't matter how sweet you look. Every one of us is going to stand in front of God's salt shaker of fire. And he's going to shake his fire shakes over us. And his, his fire is going to test the quality of what you built on top of that foundation. And if what you've built survives, you receive a reward for your labors which is astounding to me. Not only does God give us the free gift of life, but he also rewards us for what we do after that. How kind is he? But he says, if, if, if everything you've built burns, he says, you, you still get into heaven, you still make it. There's one escaping through flames. Because the foundation gets you to heaven. So the real question is, how do I build with gold, silver, and precious stones? And I want to just throw this out there to you as a whisper, as a thought. Corinthians says, now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. These three are eternal. These three will go on for eternity. Anything you do that's inspired by faith Everything you do that was moved and compelled by love, everything you do that's driven by hope is eternal and will last. So you say, well, what should I do, Greg? Well, I, I just want to challenge you to work on uh, responding to the Holy Spirit and what He's calling you to do. What steps of faith is the Holy Spirit calling you to? I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure that when you get still and you say, and you say, okay, Lord, what are you saying? The Holy Spirit's going to, with, with a bit of a glint in his eyes, going to go, okay, step out here. And it's going to require faith from you. And you know what he's doing? He's not doing that to tease you. He's doing that because faith is eternal. And every time you take a step in faith, it's logged in heaven. Every time you build with selfish ambition or arrogance, or that is not going to pass the test of fire. But when you build in faith, it passes. Love, love remains. Every time you moved by love and you did something, I don't care whether it was celebrated by this world, I don't care if this world saw it successful, I just know that when you are moved by love and you respond to what the Holy Spirit's saying, you just built a brick on the foundation of what God laid in your life and it will pass the test of fire. Faith, hope, and love. One Peter said, no, sorry, Thessalonians 1 verse 3 says, we remember before our God and Father the work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, your endurance inspired by hope. Faith, hope, and love move the church to action. And that's what God wants. Let me close. I know and believe with all my heart, every time you step out in faith, in hope, and in love, and you respond to what the Holy Spirit's stirring in you, that carries eternal weight. Oh, oh, it blesses people here. Don't, don't get me wrong. It changes things here. It moves. It can transform lives right here. And that's the beauty of it. But it more than that, it will pass the test of the fire. Now, every year, and this is our last time, we're asking people to sign up to serve. I do this with a boldness and an unashamed requirement of our members. I'm saying to the members this year, come on, sign up. 
If you haven't yet signed up to a, a grace team, I'm asking you to sign up today. So Greg, why are you so bold about this? Why is this such an issue for you? It's an issue for me because one of the ways you can log a treasure in heaven is to serve in this church. You can serve God's people. Well, I don't feel like serving it. Tough. We serve one another because that's the mandate that Jesus required. Each one should use whatever grace God has given you on your life to serve others and be faithful with the administration of God's grace on your life. So I'm asking you, if you're a member of this church, I need you to sign up to one of the grace teams. And if you haven't signed up yet, say, I'm not sure which one. Let me tell you some of those that need help. Our guest services would be a great team to sign up. You go, well, it doesn't really matter to me. Where should I go? Go sign up to guest services and sign up to children's church and sign up to the worship team and sign up to the production team. We need camera people and we need people on projection and we need, we need people to help with sound. Sign up as youth ministers. And then let me just say, especially when it comes to children and youth ministry, there, there are some background checks that must be done because we, and, and there, are some, there are some training that must be done and some, some standards that we must adhere to because we, we, it's not just, hey, I feel like working with kids. No, there's a rigorous inspection uh, and, you, and I'm sure you understand why. But we need, we need people who are dedicated and passionate about young people to help on those teams. Uh, on the worship team, like, yeah, I, I, I'd like to sing. Well, there's some auditions, right? So it's not just automatic. <laughs> we don't want you up here killing us softly with your song. You know, we want, <laughs> there's going to have to be a little, you know, audition. In the worship, in the, in the production team, there's, there's a certain skill set that's required from people. You know, there's some training. So don't go, I signed up and, and, they, and they want me to work. And they want me to, yeah, yeah, there's going to be training. Um, you'll see on that note, there are some teams that are blue. That means the teams that, that we need every week. They serve every week. That doesn't mean if you sign up, you'll serve every week. It just means that team, you know, we need, we need, we need children's ministry every week. It's not like a thing we want once a, once a month. No, it's every week, and we need people greeting every week. We need ushers every week. We need people to sign up. And then there are some teams that are in the green that are less frequent than every week, and so some people have found it useful to sign up to like, I'll serve on, on guest services, and that may be once or twice a month that I serve there, but I also s I sign up just to help with the building, and so I'm part of that team, but that, we only come in every two or three months, or whatever that is. So some people may find that, but I'm asking you to seriously consider it and sign up today. It'd be very helpful to us, um, and we need it now, because what we're going to do is we're going to take it on, uh, and we're going to start moving. We have... Uh, a significant focus and shift that happens February 4th. That's the first Sunday in February. There's a lot of changes happening, and they all kick in then. So we need you to sign up today. No more procrastination. Get involved and say, yes, you can count on me. I'm in. And uh, you need to bring your strength because we need your strength in the church. So that's that. And uh, you can see on the Build Together pamphlet, and there are places at each door where you can fill that out and just drop it in there, and we'll be in touch with you. So let me just close in prayer with that, and, uh, and then uh, we'll just see what the Lord does. I'm going to invite you to be treasure seekers. Jesus, not just invited, but commanded you to lay up treasure for yourself. One of the key ways you can do that is, tr is treasure for service. Father, thank you for this beautiful offer. Lord, how, how amazing is this salvation? How complete, Lord, that not only did you wash us completely clean. Not only, Lord, did you declare us justified in your sight. Not only, Lord, did you completely absorb all the wrath of God against our sins. Lord. Not only did you completely make us holy. Not only, Lord, did you purchase us back from every bondage that we had in our life. But you have also, Lord, now given us the right to receive rewards for our efforts. This is astounding, Father. How beautiful and kind you are. We give you honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.